Is the banking sector in the U.S. facing a financial crisis or is everything OK? What are the major risks that the banks face today and can they survive these risks? We'll be talking about these issues with our next guest, Christopher Wolf, managing director and head of North American banks at Fitch Ratings. Previously, he was an economic analyst at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. We'll be going over Fitch's most recent ratings and evaluations of the banking sector today. First, a word from our sponsor, ITRUS Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. If you'd like to learn more about the unique tax benefits you get from this IRA, click on the link down below, itrust.capital slash David, to learn more. And if you sign up using my referral link, you'll get $100 in signing bonuses. Christopher, welcome to the show. Good to have you today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Let's start by talking about the big picture first and how the U.S. economy is affecting the banking sector. Um, and we'll get into the specific uh, sector itself. Now, last year, Fitch issued a historic downgrade of the U.S. sovereign credit. Um, how is the deterioration, I would say, of U.S. Uh, credit and the strength of the fiscal situation in the U.S. affecting the banking sector today? Yeah, so that you know, we did, um, as, you, as you noted, we did downgrade the U.S. Uh, from AAA to AA plus last year. Um, that came from our sovereign team. Now, what that means for the banks, though, um, it, it didn't have a, a direct impact in terms of the credit ratings that we have on banks because none of the banks were rated that high. So our highest rated banks would be AA minus. So a couple already a couple notches below that. There's always been an, um, a, a, a correlation or a tie-in between the, you know, the strength of a sovereign and the strength of, of the banks within that um, jurisdiction. So, But it did influence our how we viewed the operating environment for the U.S. banking sector. So we did actually downgrade um, the what we call our operating environment. And that sets basically the uh, a cap, if you will, uh, on how high a, a bank can be rated. So it had been double A, we lowered it double A minus. Now, again, because the highest rated banks would be JP Morgan, Bank of America, and a few others um, at double A minus, that didn't cause any, um, there was no negative actions um, that carried through to them. Um, but it does have an influence in terms of, um, you know, sovereign credit worthiness always has an influence, um, always influences the banking sector ultimately. Yes. So let's talk about the uh, environment for the banking sector itself. I think before we get into the ratings themselves, let's talk about, I think, the question that's on everyone's mind. Are there any parallels today to 2008? Uh, you know, there, there, there's certainly, you know, you can you can think of parallels. I, I think there's um, important differences um, when we think about what we saw in the GFC. I think, you know, the lead up to the GFC, you saw a lot of growth, uh, particularly in the in the residential mortgage sector. You saw a lot of financial engineering that was occurring. Um, you know, the under you know, there's almost like there at the time there was almost an absence of underwriting, um, particularly in the home mortgage space, and but also probably true in in commercial mortgage. I think a lot of that, you know, the kind of undisciplined um, underwriting. We're not. We don't think that's really what, what we're seeing today. I think what we're seeing is, a, you know, challenges in terms of the interest rate environment, which has changed very dramatically in a very short span of time. Um, I think you had the pandemic, um, you know, that you know that it started in 2020. Um, all the fiscal and monetary, you know, stimulus that was thrown. Um, but now that as that starts to wane off, you're starting to see some of the, the challenges emerge. So I think you had a different set of circumstances. I don't, you know, it doesn't mean that there won't be problems. I just don't think we see the same kind of dynamics as we saw in the GFC, which was, I think, reckless, um, you know, reckless lending. And we will talk about the commercial real estate sector in just a bit, because I know the original banks are exposed to that sector. Uh, but overall, then, if you were to evaluate the the state of housing in America overall. Are we seeing uh, similar signs of 2007, which is to say that a bubble may be appearing and popping on the horizon? N not, not, not in our view. Um, so I think, um, especially when you think about the banking sector, so a lot of the mortgage origination activity has actually migrated out of the banking sector. It's, it, a lot of it, you know, uh, is in the in the non-bank and or un, or unregulated. Um, part of the uh, of the sector, the banks themselves. I, the underwriting has been in, in the residential mortgage is is a lot more is a lot stricter. So under Dodd Frank, there's a lot of things that have changed. So we don't see those same kind of dynamics in terms of underwriting. Now, to the extent that um, 
you know, the housing prices might be, you know, overvalued or undervalued in some markets. Certainly that um, that could be true. But we don't see that. As, that's not really an area that we think is a, a, a real area of concern for the banking system at the moment. OK, now in December uh, of 2023, Fitch issued a report and I'll just read one paragraph of this report it says fallout over higher for longer interest rates will continue to pressure liquidity and margins for U.S. banks in 2024, underpinning the maintenance of a deteriorating sector outlook, according to Fitch ratings in its outlook report. So first of all, Fitch was correct in calling for higher for longer. We haven't seen a rate cut yet, uh, but so far has the deterioration of the sector played out more or less as you had expected back in December. Largely, uh, I would say largely it has been playing out as we thought. Um, so we assumed that you know, rates were going to be higher for longer. They have been. Um, the prospects of rate cuts um, in 2024 continue to diminish. This doesn't mean they can't happen. Um, but you know the likelihood has been marked down, um, at least uh, in the markets. So you know we think banks have to contend with um, what will be a you know a higher for longer environment, and that has had some implications. But so far, we haven't been surprised by what we've seen. What does this mean for the uh, health of the balance sheet of these banks? Are they able to sustain higher rates for longer? Um, I think it depends on if rates kind of you know stabilize here. Then the, I think the answer is yes. I think if the you know if inflation um, remains um, out of bounds in terms of what you know policymakers are aiming for, and that forces them to continue to march rates up, I think that's going to create um, even more challenges for the banking sector. Okay, then that's not our that's right. not our that's not our our view at the moment. We think you know rates yeah. are probably yeah. settled out, but I think if you take a view that rates can continue to march up, I think there's a different um, there's there's that will create some new challenges. But your base case scenario is that rates will remain the same for now. Correct. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. Please yeah. continue. No, I, I think our, our our forecast is there. There's still scope for rate cuts, mm -hmm. just to be fair. Um, but if that doesn't happen, I don't think uh, that would in and of itself create new challenges. Would a rate cut immediately translate into lower consumer lending rates, for example? Not necessarily. I think it takes a little time for that to, to feed through. Um, and I so I don't think that a rate cut, even a 25 basis point cut, will matter all that much other than psychologically um, signaling that rates aren't going up. Well, there is, um, you know, the banking sector aside, uh, there is this concern that consumers are not able to withstand higher rates for longer. If you take a look at data from the St. Louis Fed, for example, delinquency on credit cards have yep. has been rising. It's now currently at 3.16%, which is the highest it's been since, I believe, 2012. Um, we're now past the pre-pandemic level, uh, mm -hmm. just about. And um, this is an interesting and possibly worrying trend. Can you comment on why this uh, this level of delinquency rate has been rising? Yeah, so I think it's pretty clear, you know, with all the, the as as consumers spent down all their all their fis, you know fiscal stimulus, um, you're kind of back to where um, you know many were you know pre-pandemic. So you're starting to see you know pre-pandemic behavior again in terms of delinquencies. We would say like during you know the pandemic, delinquencies and loss rates were were unsustainably low. Um, because of all that. So I think if you look at the, you know, the 2020 to 2022, you know, um, delinquency and loss rates, I think you you get a, a, a distorted view of what the, the underlying credits really were. Um, so I think they were artificially low, and now they're going back to um, kind of a more normalized level, which is what we think will happen. It's interesting because personal income has has been rising in recent data points. So the latest personal income data came in at 0.5% uh, higher in March. Uh, personal consumption expenditures also rose by 0.8%. Um, the data reflects an overall rise in consumer spending. So wh why are we getting this you know dual picture of consumer spending a little bit more, at least in the last month of data reported, while also delinquencies on credit cards rising? Is this a little bit strange to you? A little bit, but at the same time, I think the the the, the rising, you know, was in some ways just a more return to normal uh, oh, in terms of what I think, you know, you would normally expect in terms of uh, delinquency rates. So I think, um, and and I, I do think there was probably uh, you know some underwriting that occurred in the pandemic, which you know may have been a little bit looser um, in in some of the uh, some of the consumer sectors, which has now probably been tightened up. Are you then con assuming or expecting uh, consumer delinquencies to stabilize at current levels or uh, deteriorate even further? 
I think they have they have scope probably to deteriorate a little bit further from where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at say lagged loss rates, um, so just basically taking the the credit cards that originated um, today, um, but apply them, you know, apply the current you know delinquencies and loss rates to the balances that, that existed say nine months ago, because you know credit cards, you know the first the day you know the first day is uh, you know everything's performing. Um, it takes a little while for the losses and the delinquencies and the losses to show up. So, you know, we do think that there is some scope for some of that to um, march up a little bit, but we're we don't think it's going to get um, you know uh, significantly higher from where we are. So ultimately, then, do you think that delinquencies will present a major challenge for banks in the sense that they have to write off more bad debts and affect their valuations? No, in the sense that um, under the current uh, under the accounting models that now exist under the current expected credit loss accounting, yeah, they should already be reserving for that. So um, we shouldn't expect to see um, that really um, eat into um, profits more than than it already has. So um, you know the banks have been reserving um, in accordance with their kind of expected loss assumptions there. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk about the difference in um, in the health of larger banks versus smaller banks now, starting off with this report that was released by Fitch in March of this year. Liquidity coverage of uninsured deposits declined noticeably at U.S. banks in 2023, particularly among smaller banking institutions. Uh, the report later goes on to say, however, despite this trend, Fitch's analysis reveals no evidence that larger banks with, with assets exceeding $100 billion dollars that overwhelmingly relied on uninsured deposits have reduced the liquidity to concerning levels. Can you describe the differences overall, uh, first of all, in, in liquidity levels of larger banks and, U uh, and smaller banks, and just generally speaking, the health of uh, these two different sectors? Sure. So, I mean, what we're thinking about is what is the, what's the you know uh, you know cash on hand and the securities that they can be that can be immediately monetized um, if they're if they if they need to be, and you know, and so. Um, looking at that, and that was, a, I think, a big, um, a big challenge for some of the bank. You know, when we think back about the the bank failures that occurred last year, uh, was that they there just wasn't enough liquidity to handle the level of um, deposit withdrawals. So when we think about, um, you know, the the bigger banks, you know, liquidity seems to be very much in line. We don't see a lot of the outliers. Uh, which SVB, Signature, First Republic were um, you know, material outliers uh, on, on a number of fronts. Now, when we look at some, some, some of the smaller banks, and we don't rate many of the banks that would be you know, on, on the smaller side, um, you know, we do think that liquidity has gotten tighter for them, um, you know, even you know, relative to like pre-pandemic levels. So I think we wanted to call that out. Um, but at the same time, those banks are, are, are generally very small and wouldn't be systemic like an SVB or or, or a signature or a First Republic. Okay. Uh, so generally speaking, then, if you were to evaluate just overall the liquidity condition of smaller regional banks, are they in distress right now? I don't think that I don't think distress is the right word. I think mm -hmm. that probably over overstates. I think um, you know they they are probably in okay um, you know position. Um, it's just that. Uh, you know, they're they're mostly deposit funded institutions. They don't have a lot of wholesale other you know um, uh, borrowings. But you know, you you are seeing more reliance on say what we would say broker deposits um, or or time deposits. So you're seeing that occur, um, and that has a cost to it. So those are just more expensive ways of, of funding the balance sheet, and that will lead to margins. Um, but I think the liquidity position is 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 probably okay. I think for a lot of consumers and small businesses, they're wondering whether or not um, a regulations for capital requirements will change for banks, and b whether or not the uh, loan uh, loan to reserve ratio will change, thus negatively impact the amount of liquidity for consumers out there. So let me take your the first question is around capital. I think the 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 short answer is um, capitals will probably change. I think the big question is how and by how much, and that we don't know. So I think the the capital proposal came out last year met with a lot of opposition um, from a, a lot of different um, you know par parties. And and so I think that's been in limbo. And I think um, Jay Powell's testimony and Michael Barr's testimony recently indicated that there will be substantial changes to whatever comes next. We don't know what that means. We don't know when that will happen. Uh, but we suspect there will be some change in capital rules and that will probably, the direction of travel would be more capital. Um, so I think 
you know, we'll, we'll see where that lands, but I think that, you know, the, the direction of travel is pretty clear there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on your second point about loan, I, I, I'm not sure if I understand the... Will there be fewer loans available as a result of tighter regulations around liquidity and uh, and loans going forward? It, the potential exists. So depending on how the capital rules ultimately settle out, that could drive, um, you know, credit availability um, in, in particular, say, particular segments of, of, of lending. So if you think about Dodd-Frank, as we, um, you know, in terms of what, what that did for, for residential mortgage, that's why so more of the mortgage origination market has migrated outside of the, of the banking system. So it has the ability, you know, it could move where, who does the credit. So I think the credit could still be available, but it may not come from your traditional commercial banks. Uh, overall, then, since Dot Frank, have you noticed any changes to the um, requirements for uh, loan origination? In the words, have banks been a little more stringent in who they lend mortgages out to or uh, lines of credit out to? Yeah, cer certainly on, on residential mortgage, that has been there's been a lot more discipline around um, you know bank lending um, there, um, but you know. Uh, so absolutely, I think Dodd Frank um, has certainly uh, uh, did that. Okay, uh, let's talk about commercial real estate now. In a report by Fitch, uh, office CRE is highly vulnerable as the continuation of hybrid work leads to valuation declines. Refinancing is likely to become more difficult at lower valuations and debt service coverage ratios. Ultimately, as larger banks hold more investor properties, their portfolios, their office portfolios could diverge more from suburban owner-occupied portfolios held by the smaller banks. Um, just maybe in layman terms, uh, evaluate the health mm -hmm. of the CRE here. Yeah, so I think CRE is certainly a big challenge. And I think um, for the largest banks, CRE is um, not uh, relatively is relatively small for them. So it's not as a material of a, of a uh, factor in terms of how we think about their their credit worthiness. But as you go down in size, the concentration in commercial real estate tends to go up. And so that is why, um, you know, we've been spending as much time on it. Now, office is clearly the area of that gets the most focus and most attention because there's, you know, structural changes in terms of how, um, you know, re, you know, um, employees are, you know, return to office uh, policies are working. So there's still a lot of, I think, uncertainty. There's a there's a structural change in terms of um, how we, you know, how people go to, you know, and use offices. Um, Multifamily is another area that we've also been looking at. Um, you know, that that is certainly an area that has had a lot of growth. But there, I think, you know, the difference is, is that it's not so much as, you know, I think the demand, uh, you know, there's just a supply and demand that probably just needs to work itself out a little bit. Um, and and obviously the interest rate environment is, is affecting that. But, um, you know, we'll, that will probably sort itself out. Office is probably going to take longer. And we think that's going to play out. It's a cycle. It will probably play out over the next, you know, two years, meaning we'll still probably be thinking and talking about this next year at this time. Um, so I don't think we're going to have all the the clarity and all the answers in the next, you know, by the end of this year. Um, but it's going to be a cycle. There will be losses. Um, the banks are are reserving ahead. So if you look at some of the reserves that the bigger banks are putting up against their office portfolios. They're, they're, they're reserving in the high single digits, you know, eight, nine, 10% uh, for their office exposures already. Okay. Ultimately then, what does CRE mean for uh, the regional banks? Uh, are we expecting uh, more write-offs on their books because of the CRE deterioration? Yeah, we, we would anticipate that there will be, you know, um, you know, uh, the losses will be coming. So if you think about the global financial crisis, it took, you know the the peak losses didn't occur until almost two years after the peak. You know the the you know the 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 peak in de, in delinquencies. So it takes it takes some time for this to really roll through and show up and play out. Um, and we expect this a similar dynamic will occur um, again. Uh, I know this varies per bank, but roughly on an aggregate level, uh, how much of the loan book of a regional bank is exposed to commercial real estate? Uh, it, obviously, it will vary. Yeah. Um, so I think again, as you go further down in size, the the you know the the concentration goes up. 
Okay. Um, so if you kind of take like a mid-sized bank, you're probably, you know, 20 to 30% of the loan book somewhere in that vicinity. Okay. You mentioned multifamily. So the concern there is refinancing risk. Can we evaluate that? Uh, is it true? And, I, and I've heard this before. Is it true that a lot of people can't afford to refinance at current rates? If they locked in rates for, you know, for lower before, and now they have to refinance soon, uh, that's coming up and it's going to, it's going to really um, affect a lot of families and multifamily homes. Yeah, I, it, I think it's a, the, the challenge there is there's more, co- you know, the costs have gone up. So inflation, so, um, you know, um, insurance costs, uh, labor costs, there's a number of costs that have gone up um, to support those properties. On top of that, you know, the debt service, um, you know, because of interest rates is also impacting that. Now, that hasn't yet, it, it's starting, to, it's only starting to play through as banks, as, as properties come up for refinancing. Um, they have to be, and they have to be refinanced at higher rate. But the challenge will be is that the debt service um, uh, coverage that you know most banks will aim for is going to be a is going to be a challenge, meaning, you know, if you underwrote a loan with a debt service coverage ratio of say one and a half times, you know, five years ago, um, now when you play out and and layer in the additional costs and higher interest, um, what is that debt service coverage now? And is particularly if it's starting to dip below, you know, one times, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. And one, one a narrative I've heard is that the, one of the reasons why the residential real estate market hasn't collapsed across the board is because a lot of people don't want to sell their properties, even though they may have realized or have unrealized capital gains on those properties. They don't want to sell it off and buy another home for a higher rate. <laughs> Um, so ironically, a higher rate is keeping the se- sector afloat. Should mortgage rates come down, though, later, Christopher, suppose they do, would this reverse? Will we actually see massive sell-off across the board? I don't know that we'll see massive sell-off. I think, um, you know, uh, at some point, people will need to make some decisions if you, you know, um, you might have to suck, you know, um, you know, if you're looking for a home, you might just have to, you know, buy a, you know, you know, take the rates now and hope that you can refinance later on down the line. So I, I, it just might hold some people back from doing things, um, uh, uh, at a, you know, right now when they would, you know, maybe they'll have to do those in two or three years time, but you're also getting to a point where, you know, boomers, um, you know, there'll be some generational shifts. Um, people will want to downsize, um, that, that will probably have to happen. Okay. And now, uh, you've evaluated the, um, uh, 13, Banks. So you've done a peer review of 13 Fitch rated banks. You've only downgraded, Fitch has only downgraded one of them, uh, mm-hmm. UMB Financial Corporation. Um, and you've kept the other uh, 12 uh, with a stable outlook. Uh, why have you not downgraded more banks given the overall deteriorating outlook for the sector? Yeah. So, the, and there's a couple that uh, I think there's a couple that also carry a negative rating outlook as yeah. well. So that just implies that um, we didn't downgrade them, but there is some pressure on their rating. Mm hmm. And, and the way we, you know, we think about it is we, you know, we rate per our criteria and our criteria, you know, um, relative to our criteria, the ratings still hold, but the, the what we would call the rating headroom. So how much, how much could you know, certain financial measures slip has diminished, um, meaning uh, there's probably more um, sensitivity on their ratings, um, even if they remain where they are. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see anything on this list. And I'll put the full list on the screen for the viewers uh, below double, uh, triple B uh, and uh, double B plus. So nothing has fallen below investment grade yet. Uh, other than New York Community Bank, um, okay. which did fall below. Now that that list isn't a full list. That's just what we would call but, our mid-sized regional banks. And okay. we have larger okay. regional banks um as well. So sure. again, there, there is a, you know, the, the level of well, what we would call negative rating outlooks is a lot higher than it had been even, you know, one or two years ago. Do you think banks today are able to uh, charge a higher spread on their consumers uh, with higher interest rates for them as well? Is that, is that an environment that they could um, handle? Yeah. And, and they are, they have been, you know, um, passing the higher interest rate costs onto consumers uh, as you would expect. Um, but the other dynamic that's also playing out is just the, um, you know, when you think about the the, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, and there's been a lot of um, uh, rulemakings that they've been pushing um, that would affect, you know, the ability of banks to charge fees. 
And so the banks need to then figure out how do they, you know, recoup um, some of that lost revenue and some of that will come through just higher, you know, higher interest rate, higher interest rate costs on the consumer. Okay. Now, finally, uh, I want to ask you about uh, systemic risk. Suppose a large bank were to fail. I'm not saying it will, but just, you know, hypothetically suppose, could we get a uh, systemic financial collapse like uh, like GFC? Well, I, I think the... It, it, it's a very interesting question in the sense that I don't think anybody knows the answer mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to pretend that I do. Okay. Um, but I think the Credit Suisse example was very interesting watching that play out. Yeah. Um, how that ultimately was resolved. I do think that um, the system is in a better position because of some of the resolution authorities and the plans that have been put forth and promulgated. So I think I think the regulators were woefully unprepared um, in 2008 for what transpired. Um, I think if we see something like that again, I think there's at least a lot more thought around what needs to be done, how it needs to be done. It doesn't mean everything will work you know, according to plan or that there won't be any kind of disruption, only that I think there's a lot more appreciation and understanding of what um, something like that could mean and how to deal with it. Uh, I wonder if your base case scenario factors in the possibility of a recession and how that would impact uh, the health of the banking sector. So, um, yeah, our, our forecast, I think when we came into the year, we had still assumed that there was going to be a short and mild recession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had, we, we've dialed that back. It doesn't look as if we're going to see a recession in 2024. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, like a short and mild recession should not be something that um, uh, really hurts a bank or, or its ratings. So I think you know that there there'll be some some challenges some some higher losses but that should not be something that um really affects a bank we we try to rate through that kind of a cycle so right. we we incorporate and assume that the, the economic conditions aren't always um benign uh, so so just doing a sensitivity analysis what would trigger a worst case scenario suppose we have massive delinquency spikes suppose we have uh failures across commercial real estate and residential real estate all of these things would dramatically negatively affect banks of course what would trigger such a scenario so i think it's you know it's 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 you know some kind of shock to the economy either from un, you know unemployment um rates geopolitics which is very difficult um uh to predict uh, so those are the kinds of things, so those kinds of shocks that those are the things that would drive all else. Um, I, I don't think, you know, we're going to see consumer delinquencies spike just in, in isolation right. or in a vacuum. Something would have to be driving that. So finally then, uh, Christopher, putting all this together, uh, roughly, and you know, you may or may not know the answer, but is there a significant number of banks facing, um, a high insolvency risk today? So we, we tried to take and again we don't rate we don't rate many of the you know the banking system has got you know, 4600 banks we we rate a you know a subset of that. Um when we looked at commercial real estate we played out a commercial real estate stress we do think that there could be um you know I think we sized it about 20 22 banks that would be breaching their kind of capital requirements. It doesn't make it they're insolvent just means they would be in some kind of you know regulatory hot water um from their capital ratios. Um so depending on how severe of a CRE stress you play out, I think um, certainly there could be some further challenges for banks, not just from CRE, but also to the extent you have, again, going back to a a, a rate uh, scenario that um, where the Fed moves rates up further would certainly put more pressure on 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 the um, the, the securities marks that are in, in capital. Um, so, I, I, you know. You you can see you can create a scenario where you see you know some more some more banks fail or just they become more stressed. Are are you expecting more mergers or acquisitions from the larger banks? We think that there's a desire um, for for more M and A activity to occur. I think the challenge right now is both the 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 merger math is probably still problematic, meaning um, the mark to market um, the marks that uh, 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 banks have to take in order to get a deal done. And then at the same time, you're seeing the regulators put up, you know, more roadblocks um, to get a deal through. So you've seen the OCC put out its 
proposal on how it will um, review um, mergers and acquisitions. And the FDIC, you know, followed suit with a similar um, with similar guidance in terms of what it will be doing. So there's a lot more, I think, um, policy pushback uh, on M and A. Um, I think the timing is probably not great for um, M and A to occur, but I think ultimately there probably needs to be more consolidation um, within the system. Okay, and final question, Chris. I'll let you go. Uh, do you think just sentiment from the consumers? Do you think there's going to be more of an interest to um, place deposits outside of the bank, money market funds, for example, uh, decentralized digital uh, asset managers, for example, following the collapse of several banks last year and also uh, Republic First just a month ago? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think consumers probably tend to be, especially if you're if you're an insured deposit. I think have been relatively insensitive yeah. um, to what's been happening. So, I think for a large part, large portion of consumers, they've been very indifferent. Um, they may elect to move their money here, you know, into other sources, but they haven't really uh, they haven't really moved um, like you would think. Okay, interesting. Well. Wonderful discussion. Thank you very much for your time today, Christopher. Where can we learn more about, uh, I guess, your work and uh, Fitch's work? Uh, uh, our website, uh, www.fitchratings.com. Um, there's a lot of a um, lot of uh, access that you can get just for uh, for signing in. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll put the link down below, so make sure to check that out. Thank you very much again for your time, Chris. All right, thank you. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.